Now, I want to say some things uh, to uh, finish up with the so-called utopian socialists, uh, which, as I mentioned uh, to you, was a, uh, uh, a strategically um, concocted term to uh, uh, denigrate the enemies of Marx and Lenin, uh, invented by Marx and Lenin. Uh, the last of these um, uh, early French socialists, and by far the most uh, influential, uh, was the school of Saint-Simon. <coughs> Let me mention one more time the work by Alexander Gray, The Socialist Tradition, which is important uh, for this. And we're talking now about Henri de Saint-Simon and his followers, the most important of whom were Enfantin and Bazar. Saint-Simon is a uh, famous uh, aristocratic name in France, and he was indeed a, a member of the nobility. Saint-Simon was a, a, a very peculiar character. Uh, he uh, uh, flourished during the Assignat inflation by speculating in the in the currency, made money that way, but then he lost a huge uh, fortune, and was reduced uh, uh, to writing uh, rather pathetic letters to the crowned heads of Europe, informing them that he was starving to death and uh, pleased to send him money, um, which never uh, came about. And then somehow he uh, uh, revived his fortunes. Uh, he lived in Paris um, in the area of uh, the École Polytechnique, uh, which had been uh, set up around this time. Uh, and uh, this was one of the great scientific uh, centers of Europe, and um, he loved um, uh, associating with uh, scientists and mathematicians and uh, dining with them and uh, cultivating them uh, and so on. This is going to be important in the creation of his philosophy. But um, a, a, a crucial fact about him is that uh, he, Saint-Simon and also his followers became very interested in the uh, works of the theocratic conservative as they're sometimes called, uh, writers of this time, especially De Maistre and also Bonald. Now, these writers rejected the French Revolution, of course. They rejected uh, the French Enlightenment. They were much more conservative and uh, even reactionary, much more than Burke was. Burke was um, fundamentally a, a supporter of the free market and uh, free Whiggish a British society. Uh, these men, especially de Maistre, who was influential, <clears throat> wanted to return not to the pre-1789 old regime, but back to the Middle Ages. And they're called theocrats uh, because um, uh, what they bemoaned was the absence of authority and hierarchy in modern society, and uh, uh, f uh, promoted the uh, creation of um, uh, new, uh, or, or uh, revived centers of authority and hierarchy, culminating in the Pope. Uh, that is, they were ultramontanes in the Catholic tradition, that is, um, looking to the supremacy of the Pope. They were p a part of the movement that uh, idealized the Middle Ages in a particular way, not the Middle Ages that, that we've talked about here, that is, the um, uh, enterprising Middle Ages, the Middle Ages of the towns, the Middle Ages of the beginning of, uh, um, of European and world commerce, uh, the Middle Ages that gave rise, rise to free institutions. Instead, uh, you could say that they adopted the reverse <laughs> of, a, of a Protestant and Enlightenment uh, stereotype of the Middle Ages as a society of total stability and adherence to the status quo. That, they thought, was sort of society that uh, was uh, most desirable, especially after all the tribulations and the upheavals of the revolutionary period. And uh, uh, in tracing uh, this uh, revolutionary philosophy that they thought had cultivated, uh, culminated in the uh, uh, excesses of the revolution and the reign of terror, uh, they went back to the people they considered the uh, uh, the first uh, real revolutionary as well. The first revolutionary, of course, was Lucifer, um, in their view, who uh, rose up against God himself. But they went back to Descartes, uh, who um, uh, introduced uh, the um, uh, modern uh, philosophy, uh, introduced modern philosophy with the idea of systematic doubt. But above all, the reformers of the Protestant Reformation. 
They were the ones who began to undermine traditional European society. So what we have with them, and uh, Demetrius especially was a, was an intelligent uh, man. Uh, it's from my point of view, just as uh, uh, his ideas that were uh, fundamentally uh, flawed and uh, uh, the Sansimonians, and, well, beginning with Sansimon, and then he collected a school, found this really fascinating. Uh, yes, there was something wrong with uh, modern history. There is a, a, a deep flaw in the French uh, uh, Revolution, in, in the Enlightenment, and also among the French revolutionaries. Uh, however, uh, it's not backwards that we have to look uh, for a society of uh, stability and um, uh, and uh, hierarchy and authority, but to the future. And where was this new authority to come from? Uh, who was to compose uh, this uh, new hierarchy? Well, Saint-Simon learned from, or, or thought he learned, it wasn't the position of the, of the scientists themselves, but uh, his idea of what the scientists were up to, this new authority was to be found in modern science. And uh, the new hierarchy was to be composed of the, um, of the uh, proponents of the scientific world outlook. So that with Saint-Simon, and uh, he had these uh, immediate disciples. He also had a disciple, a man who was his uh, personal secretary, uh, who, went, uh, who then went uh, out on his own, a man named Auguste Comte. And it's this school of thought that um, is the founder uh, of positivism. The point of view that says that the only real, authentic knowledge of the world is to be gained through the methods of natural science. Um, This Hayek deals with, in a book that I've mentioned to you, it's an important book called The Counter-Revolution of Science. Uh, It's a 1950s book of his. Uh, The first half, or the first part, uh, is um, uh, about the methodology and philosophy. A little tough going, perhaps. Uh, What is uh, most fascinating, I think, is the second part, about the actual history of this uh, philosophy of positivism. He talks about the Sansimonians, about uh, Auguste Comte, and, um, and further ramifications. Maybe... Uh, this begins to ring a bell with you, uh, the idea that uh, um, the so-called social sciences, by the way, Auguste Comte uh, coined the, uh, the term sociology, uh, the idea that the uh, so-called social sciences must uh, imitate the methods of the natural sciences. What that means, for instance, is that in economics, we don't have a science that's built up in an a priori way, uh, as the great the classical thinkers of the 19th century, and especially the Austrian school, <laughs> insisted. Uh, what we have to have is a science that collects facts, uh, 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 statistics, and so on, and in this way builds up theories uh, analogously to the, to the natural sciences. Uh, since the only authentic knowledge comes through the methods of the natural sciences, of course, you really can't get any knowledge from religion, uh, from, uh, uh, from tradition, uh, from uh, history. Um, uh, it has to be done in uh, a modern scientific way. And what's the point of all this? Well, as with the natural sciences, knowledge is power. Um, this would have been set up by people like Francis Bacon. Once the natural sciences uh, accumulate uh, sufficient knowledge, uh, the, the world is, is ours. We can do anything we, we want with it. Uh, in medicine, in the civil engineering, uh, in um, um, uh, uh, exploiting natural resources, and anything. We use the methods of natural science, the conclusions of natural science, to rule the natural world. Well, uh, similarly, if we have a social science that's based on the methods of natural science, then that knowledge is power. And that knowledge is power over man and society. The um, idea was that uh, in the future there would be developed a class of individuals uh, who, let's not, uh, uh, they didn't bother to, uh, to beat around the bush, we can call priests of positivism. They would be imbued with the philosophy of positivism, of positive social science, and they would know how to apply that uh, in a social engineering kind of way to remake 
society uh, to remake the nature of, of man. All of the human problems could eventually be solved in the same way the technical uh, engineering problems are solved by the natural sciences. Crime, well, uh, we would investigate the causes of crime, the roots of crime. Does this sound familiar? And then start dealing with those causes and roots of crime. Eventually, there would be no crime. All it takes is knowing enough about the subject. Um, now, um, they had also a philosophy of history that, that, that dovetailed with this. The period we're talking about, the first few decades of the 19th century, is a time when a lot of people had philosophies of history. I talked to you about the industrialist school and their philosophy of history of the predatory and the preyed upon classes. Well, the Sansimonians had a philosophy of history also uh, that uh, dovetailed with their uh, theory. History alternates between two phases. There is an organic phase, and then this is followed by a critical phase. An organic f phase is um, uh, characterized by stability, a uh, sense of authority in society, uh, social harmony, uh, the, sub, the uh, subjection of the individual to the, to the community, uh, and uh, in this way provides a, um, a comfortable, psychologically uh, uh, appealing uh, cocoon for the individual. The individual doesn't have to worry. He's told by his society what, how to live his life, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, there are no uh, questions that come up to produce anxiety. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, in each of these previous organic periods, the, there was a prevailing philosophy. Well, it, um, I mean, it necessarily is, but it's unfortunate that the prevailing ph philosophy was inadequate. Uh, for instance, in uh, archaic Greece, before about the 5th century, there was a belief in the, uh, in the particular gods, in the uh, 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 rituals of the gods, uh, in the... Uh, uh, Homeric heroes, uh, in the uh, right of the chieftains to rule, um, and this provided a, uh, a structure for the organic phase of Greek society. However, that was uh, followed by the period of the philosophers, <clears throat> especially, let's say, someone like Socrates, kind of a model philosopher who began questioning everything. Uh, what is justice, as the beginning question of the Republic is? What is justice? Well, in an organic society, everybody knows intuitively, instinctively what's justice, what's right and wrong. Now the philosophers wanted to get have reasons for it. You say this is justice, why? In the Sansimonian view, that began the eroding of this organic phase and the coming into existence of a critical phase. It was necessary because the old uh, ideas were not really adequate, the ideas of the Greek gods and goddesses. They were not really adequate, so it was necessary to be that it was um, uh, that the old system made way for a critical phase. However, human beings really can't live uh, in critical phases. It's, they're not made for it. Uh, it does uh, uh, create too much uh, anxiety, uh, questioning, uh, uh, problems. As uh, if we were to take a modern example, <coughs> one might say, a sensimony might say, is the case today. Who knows how to raise children today in our society? Who knows how to raise children? At one time... People had a very good idea how to raise children. Um, you know, in my neighborhood, Angelo, come over here, I'd break your legs. Um, if, you, if you keep doing that, I'd break your legs. Wait until your father gets home. Um, and um, uh, I don't know, I thought it worked pretty good. But uh, nowadays, there are so many conflicting ways. And young couples, uh, now if they have, happen to have some anchor in their life, uh, all to the good. Uh, if they're the typical product of, uh, of uh, liberal education, so-called liberal education in America, there are real problems. And, um, uh, and then very soon after, maybe at, at about the age of two and a half, the kid takes over. <laughs> uh, and that certainly leads to its own problems. So you see, so this, in other words, is a critical phase of the evolution of our society, and people are not sure about things. Um, now... So the critical phase of ancient society was followed by an organic phase, according to the Sansimonians, and that was medieval Catholicism. Okay? There was a, uh, uh, an assured sense of uh, the uh, rightness of things. Um, you can see it, for instance, in any of the great medieval systems, let's say Dante's uh, uh, Paradise Lost. Um, 
in society, in uh, uh, that is in the social structure of feudalism, uh, in uh, religion, one religion, uh, and within that religion, the authority of the Pope at the very top. Um, there was the great chain of being uh, with God at, at the top and then uh, the angels and then uh, the uh, Pope and then the kings and then the uh, uh, nobility and then average people and among average people, the father and the family uh, ruling it over the mother, the parents ruling it over the children, human beings ruling it over animals. <clears throat> that was the great chain of being going from the very top to the bottom. And according to the Sansimonians, who, like everyone at the time, had a very simplistic view of what the Middle Ages was like, um, that provided the organic phase that was necessary. However, <clears throat> as with the um, Greek gods, medieval Catholicism could not withstand criticism of critical reasoning. So the Protestant Reformation came along. If this seems, you know, awfully quick to you, well, I'm, I'm saying they're not... Uh, particularly deep uh, uh, historians. The Protestant Reformation came along, and above all, the rise of modern science. Okay? So, the medieval synthesis was shattered, and a period, a critical period followed. And that critical period lasted for a number of centuries. The French, the French Enlightenment is a good example of it, destroying everything and really creating not very much positive from the Sansimonian point of view. The French Revolution illustrated that in, in politics. And now the time has come for the creation of a new organic stage of society. And this will be the last stage of society. Uh, that's another thing these philosophies of history had in common. They not only talked about how uh, history had developed up into, until this time, but somehow, either now or very soon, the end stage will have been reached. Because now we have a, um, uh, an authority, we have an authority, we have an overriding philosophy that is, uh, can be permanent, and that is positivism. That is the application of modern science <clears throat> to social, to all social and human questions. So the Sansimonian idea was we're going to be able to solve the, uh, uh, all of the problems uh, created by critical phases, all of the um, anxieties and, uh, and conflicts, uh, and enter onto an organic phase that will be permanent. Uh, it will be the rule over society of the, of the positivist thinkers, posit po positivist priests, uh, wielding the methods of, of uh, positive science. Uh, and this is going to have implications for... Uh, uh, for uh, every aspect of society. Now, saint Simon's uh, last work was the New Christianity, because it turns out that positivism is another aspect of true Christianity. Cr true Christianity has nothing to do with particular doctrines um, or particular um, uh, particular liturgy, particular. Uh, uh, services in, in one religion or another. True Christianity is simply the message of Jesus. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And it's, and the uh, positivist um, uh, rulers of society will be using the methods of natural science to further the aim of true Christianity, of a total human brotherhood um, uh, among people of a nation and eventually of the whole world. Now, Saint-Simon um, maybe is not uh, uh, himself, strictly speaking, a socialist, but his followers certainly were. And um, they were uh, the most uh, consistent and, for a time, the best-known socialists in Europe. He died in um, uh, 1825, and uh, just a few years later, uh, his uh, followers, the Sansimonians, began uh, holding, uh, first of all, a series of uh, famous lectures in Paris, to which hundreds and hundreds of people came, hundreds and hundreds of people of the elite, and foreigners of the elite also. Heinrich Heine, the German poet, uh, attended these um, these uh, uh, lectures. And here, they, and, and then pu they published the exposition of the doctrine of Saint-Simon, which was largely their own uh, uh, doctrine. Here they came up with most of the arguments against modern capitalism. 
modern capitalism is a new form of feudalism. Uh, now the uh, rule of the, uh, of the uh, factory owner over his wage slaves. Uh, modern capitalism deal, uh, uh, leads uh, eventually to depressions, the business cycle. This is inherent in capitalism. Competition is uh, inherently and vastly uh, wasteful. What is the point of having two different companies building railroads from Paris to Lyon when we can have uh, scientists, engineers, experts get together, find out which the best route between Paris and Lyon is, and build that instead of having trains going half full from uh, 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 each of two competing companies, we would have a prosperous uh, uh, railroad company uh, that was built by experts. And they came up with the idea that these experts would get together, um, experts in all fields, and concoct uh, plans for all the, the whole economic life of society. In this way, the Sansimonians uh, really were the uh, originators of the idea of central economic planning. Uh, for a while, in the, 19, uh, in the 18, uh, late 1820s, 1830s, Sansimonianism was um, the, um, uh, the success of the day in, uh, in Europe. It was the wave of the future. It was a kind of, it was a sort of thing that anybody who was interested in fashionable ideas would get acquainted with. Uh, think about, uh, adopt very often. Karl Marx, a young, uh, a young lad in, um, um, in the Rhineland, in his, uh, in his uh, hometown, um, uh, had a, uh, there was an elderly uh, gentleman, or an older man there, uh, the uh, um, man named von Westphalen, a uh, minor uh, nobleman, uh, and uh, Marx was already, in his young teen years, interested in, um, in uh, new ideas. And one of the main things that he discussed with uh, this gentleman were the ideas of the Sansimonians. Uh, Westphalen afterwards became Marx's father-in-law when uh, uh, Marx uh, married his daughter. Uh, but what I'm getting at is that uh, here, uh, Karl Marx, uh, interested in what, what's uh, fashionable in the way of ideas, uh, being acquaint, uh, coming to be acquainted with Sansimonianism. Um, so this, is, this sets the stage now, in the 1830s, early 1840s, for the appearance of Marxism. Now, Marxism, the thing to understand about Marx, as Murray Rothbard says, the beginning of his many pages on Marx, at uh, I guess the end of his um, of the second volume of his uh, history of economic thought, the thing to understand about Marx is that Marx was a communist. <laughs> okay, uh, and what Murray means, among other things, by that is that Marx was a communist before he was anything else. That is, he was a communist before he was an economist. Um, in fact, he learned economics in order to rationalize his communism. This is well known among uh, people who know about Marx's life. By 1844, he had already written, but not published, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, or sometimes called the Paris Manuscripts. They were only discovered long after, around 1930, and then they were published, and for a while uh, created a whole industry called Marxist humanism. Uh, that is, uh, the, the Marx, who wasn't uh, uh, a determinist, but somehow more humanistic, now, there, it's easy to find these things in print. And you look at the, the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, there's no economics at all. All it is is, uh, is playing around with the Hegelian kind of uh, uh, categories. There's uh, what's sometimes called a philosophical anthropology that is dealing with the nature of man and, uh, and juggling around uh, uh, aspects of that in a philosophical way. Uh, having uh, no connection with empirical reality, practically, and certainly no connection with economics. It was only around this time, in the mid-1840s, that Marx became interested in economics for the first time. And uh, under the influence of another um, uh, young German that he had met, uh, Friedrich Engels. By the way, let me say something about the literature on this subject. I've mentioned Alexander Gray, who also has some very good chapters on Marx and Marxism and the different Marxists. This 
this has um, as much to do with uh, this book I'm talking about now, as much to do with Soviet Russia as with Marxism. Um, and I, I mentioned uh, la- the last time the book by Martin uh, Malia on um, the uh, uh, on the Soviet Union. Now, Leszek uh, Kalakowski, who's still alive, was at one time himself a communist in Poland. Uh, however, he um, outgrew that, uh, became a critic of uh, communism, uh, and 18, in the 1970s uh, wrote a, magnif- a magnificent three-volume work called Main Currents of Marxist Thought. Um, it's uh, still, I think, still in paperback from Oxford University Press. Uh, the first volume on origins of Marxism and the and Marx and Engels. The second volume on the uh, uh, thinkers of the Second International, like Lenin, uh, for instance. And the third volume on uh, on uh, 20th century uh, Marxists. It is one of the great works of intellectual history of the 20th century, in my opinion. And uh, Lesik Kalakowski is a great scholar. <clears throat> familiar with all of the relevant uh, uh, languages, we saw something about the um, about the uh, uh, the depths of the of um, uh, stupidity of uh, many Americans in regard to foreigners just a few weeks ago when they started uh, when they, they started um, uh, mocking the French and France and French culture. Um, there are Americans who mock. The Polish people, the great Polish people. Uh, Leszek Kalakowski is a good uh, uh, antidote to that. He's a man, he is today even, a man of immense learning. And this, the, 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 these three volumes are indispensable, I would say, to anyone interested in, in Marxism. I suppose it would come um, as a surprise to many of the people who uh, retail Polish jokes uh, and uh, so on, that uh, uh, among the greatest logicians of the 20th century were Poles which is one reason why the Poles were able to crack the German code and uh, bring their findings over to England and uh, uh, were instrumental in uh, permitting the uh, British to follow uh, German secret uh, messages in their code. Well, this is as far as uh, the literature goes. Let me, Paul Craig Roberts, I see that his book is available right out here, Alienation in the Soviet Economy. Now, what Roberts does is very interesting. Uh, some people have said, well, in the uh, early Marx, the humanist Marx, uh, the uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts, for instance, he keeps talking about alienation. Um, but when the uh, but that um, goes out of uh, uh, escapes uh, uh, Marx's attention after a short while, and then he starts talking in the very familiar terms uh, about uh, historical determinism and uh, substructure, superstructure and uh, uh, one phase of uh, society necessarily following another. (laughs) Therefore, this earlier humanist Marx, with his emphasis on alienation, is not very important. What Robert shows is really that that concept, although not explicitly used by Marx in later years, underlay everything that he did afterwards, and underlay also the Soviet experiment. Um, So I I think that this is a, a very important uh, work of Marxist scholarship, I think, uh, uh, fairly brief, but with, a, uh, uh, an, uh, with very important implications. What, what was Marx after? It would be a terrible mistake, and Lenin understood this. This is why he hated the revision of socialists. It would be a terrible mistake to reduce Marxism to the idea that, uh, that uh, uh, working people would be a lot better off under socialism that socialism is more efficient, will bring prosperity uh, to all, uh, will do away with class domination. Uh, yes, he believed those things. But most of all, and centrally what he believed, was that for the first time, human, the human race could achieve real human dignity, which it, it had not up until now. Why not? Because up until now, human history has been accidental. People have done things, acted in history, and often their uh, actions produced consequences, the opposite of what people wanted. Nobody wants depressions, for instance. And yet the capitalist system is such that people act 
and within a, a limited sense they act rationally, and yet depressions occur. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that man does not have control of his own destiny. And man will not have control of his own destiny until the time comes when society is totally planned. That planning aspect is not simply a way of bringing about more efficiency. It's a way of affirming human dignity and the human control of human affairs. Um, Marx, as I said last time, there aren't very much, uh, uh, there isn't very much in the corpus of Marx and Engels that tells us what the future society is going to be ab- uh, about, but this, this, uh, um, this point is certainly clear. This is what Marx wrote uh, of the stage of communist society just before the disappearance of, sc- of scarcity. Freedom in this field can only consist in socialized man, the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under a common control, instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature. You understand what he's saying? He's not talking about thunderstorms or earthquakes. He's talking about the course of history as being um, like the blind forces of nature in that human beings have to submit to, have to endure um, events, uh, sufferings that they never intended. Um, the point is made clearer uh, by Engels. Uh, this is a longish quote, but I, um, I'll read it in such a way I hope that you can follow it and you can understand what he's getting at. With the seizure of the means of production by society, production of commodities is done away with. Production of commodities is what uh, he means by the, uh, uh, the non name for the market economy. <laughs> Production of commodities is done away with, and with it, the dominion of product over the producers. In the market economy, with the so-called invisible hand, there is no invisible hand. It's total anarchy of production. Anarchy of production, a term coined by the Sansimonians. As in here, repeated by Engels, anarchy of social production is replaced by conscious organization according to plan. The whole sphere of the conditions of life which surround men which ruled men up until now, now comes under the dominion and conscious control of men, who become for the first time the real conscious lords of nature, because, and in that, they become masters of their own social organization. The laws of their own social activity, which confronted them until this point as alien laws of nature, controlling them, then are applied by men with full understanding and so mastered by them. Only from then on will men make their history themselves in full consciousness. Do you understand that? Make their history themselves in full consciousness. That is, everything that happens in history will have been planned. Only from then on will the social causes they set into motion have in the main and in constantly increasing proportion also the results intended by them. It is a leap of mankind from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. In another uh, uh, place, uh, Engels refers to it as the end of the prehistory of mankind. Up until now, uh, it's been almost like uh, the history of the apes, Uh, human beings not in control of their destiny. Only with this total conscious planning of the economy and society will human beings then be in control of their destiny. Of, uh, of their history. So this is what um, was aimed at uh, as the ultimate uh, goal of, uh, of communist society. And this is uh, what um, Lenin understood. This is what uh, the other Bolsheviks, Trotsky especially, uh, understood. Now I mentioned uh, revisionist uh, socialism. Much could be said about uh, the, uh, the history of uh, Marxism um, and uh, Marx dies in 1883 and Engels in 1895. They live a long time. They, live a, they uh, uh, write a lot of things. Um, they engage when they can in um, revolutionary activity, especially in 1848. But Europe is sort of quiescent. When the Paris Commune comes about in 1871, suddenly uh, uh, their excitement is uh, ignited again, and they think that well, this is maybe the dawn of the revolution. 
It wasn't even a Marxist revolution. It was uh, more of a Jacobin uh, and even uh, a Proudhonist uh, uh, revolt in Paris. Um, so it never amounted uh, to anything. So the actual revolutionary activity they could engage in was limited. They did form the fir- help form with others, the first international, um, the international of, uh, of uh, working, the working men's international. Uh, but that uh, came to grief uh, uh, over uh, the um, uh, conflict between uh, Marx and his side and Bakunin and the anarchists. Uh, Bakunin, uh, incidentally, uh, maybe, well, you probably know the name Bakunin, right? He was a lovable old psychotic. Um, he was an anarchist and um, just traveled around trying to, um, uh, in, the, in the mid-century, he died, um, what, in the 1870s, I think, uh, trying to um, uh, raise up revolution wherever he went. He'd go to some country and learn enough of the language to start, start haranguing mobs and uh, uh, so on. He, uh, he never really succeeded very much. He was in Dresden during the Saxon Revolution of 1849 and heard Wagner conducting uh, Beethoven's Ninth. And Bakunin said, uh, what a pity that this too must be destroyed. You know, I mean, crazy things <laughs> like, like that. Um, on the other hand, you know, he never actually killed anybody. Um, he was imprisoned by the Tsars and escaped from the Peter and Paul a fortress in, uh, in what was then St. Petersburg. And he tried to get back into Europe to start revolutions again. He went the long route, you know, across Siberia. Uh, well, it just was uh, 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 less danger of coming across the police. Came to America, <laughs> looked around and said uh, something to the effect of, why am I spending my time on this anarchy? They have anarchy. <laughs> where, where is the government here? Made his way uh, uh, to Europe, um, constantly uh, 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 writing pamphlets and so on. Now, he translated the Communist Manifesto into Russian. So uh, uh, he was an admirer of Marx, and uh, especially Marx and of Engels, uh, uh, for a while, but then became progressively disillusioned. And he was the first, Bakunin was the first critic of Marxism to bring up the question of the new class. That became famous in criticisms of uh, of uh, Marxism. Uh, the most famous, although not the, uh, the deepest critic along these lines, was the Yugoslav uh, Milovan Gilas, who wrote a book that was uh, titled The New Class uh, in the uh, post-World War II period. But other anarchists along the line, this was their main criticism of Marxism, and that's why they insisted that the state had to be abolished totally and immediately. Um, because, they said, the alternative was that a small group, as Marx said, the communists are the vanguard of the proletariat uh, because they, they know more about the historical process than the proletariat does. Uh, the alternative is that, is, is that a small group is going to gain control of the state. And what reason is there suppo- to suppose they'll ever give up their power? Uh, he noticed that in the Communist Manifesto, one of the... Uh, Items is that, uh, that uh, agriculture is now to be uh, conducted by vast armies of agricultural laborers. Bakunin said an army means that there are soldiers and there are officers. And uh, what have we got here? These vast armies working the, the fields and the plantations. What we have here is the Roman latifundia again. What we have here is a new system of slavery uh, under a new ruling class. Well, Marx didn't didn't want to hear this, and um, it, correspondence between Marx and Engels, I haven't actually uh, checked it out, I've just, I mean, except for certain uh, uh, theoretically important letters, but they're filled with ethnic uh, and racial slurs, uh, mainly against their socialist and anarchist uh, opponents. But Bakunin himself said that uh, it's, uh, Marx's uh, position is very typically Jewish, very typically Jewish and German. Uh, Bakunin being uh, a Russian and uh, not Jewish. So um, uh, this is an, uh, somewhat amusing, uh, but also because of Bakunin's analysis, interesting episode in the, uh, in the 19th century uh, history of uh, radicalism. Uh, Bakunin 
did start some uh, centers of anarchism, mainly in Spain. And the anarchists come uh, around during the uh, Spanish Civil War, also in Italy. But it was uh, Marxist socialism that uh, uh, prevailed. And Marxist socialism, that the Marxist idea that uh, finally took over the great social democratic party of Germany, the SPD, which, as you know, exists to the present day and is the ruling party in uh, Germany. Um, and uh, towards the end of the 19th century, the great, uh, especially after Engels passes away, the great theoreticians of Marxism are mainly uh, German uh, socialists. But after Engels dies, uh, maybe he waited for it, uh, one of the uh, German socialist leaders, Edward Bernstein, begins to publish works uh, that are questioning and then critical, although he'd been very close to Engels. What Bernstein says is this. Okay, we're at the end of the 19th century. Marx had a definite scenario for the collapse of, communis- of capitalism. The working class would get poorer and poorer. Capitalism is not able to sustain its slaves in their uh, slavery. Um, there would be fewer and fewer businesses, and uh, ultimately only a very few very large businesses. The middle class is going to disappear. The business cycle is going to get worse and worse. Uh, and then finally, uh, with the organization of the working class by the communists, um, society will have had enough, and the socialist revolution will occur. Bernstein said, none of these things is happening. The working people are not getting poorer and poorer, far from it. We now have the, uh, of course, there, uh, there's uh, much poverty in uh, pockets of a lot of, of deep po- poverty, but we have the most affluent working classes that have existed in Europe. Uh, there are very big businesses, but there are more and more small businesses that act as feeders to the big businesses. And anyway, you have the joint a stock company, which means you have a big business, but there can be thousands and thousands of owners of this uh, big business. There is a business cycle, but it does not appear to be getting worse than it has been in the past. So what are we going to do? Uh, doomsday for capitalism is not, uh, uh, does not seem to be around the corner. And what uh, he says is what we have to, re- we have to revise Marxism. So is the, uh, or, uh, Bernstein's writings are the origin of revisionist Marxism. He says, there's not going to be any de tag, there's not going to be any the day when capitalism falls to be replaced by socialism. We have to work for piecemeal reform through labor unions, through uh, government uh, regulation. Well, if you, as you, if you think about it, so Bernstein's revisionism that was condemned by the, by the big uh, socialist theor- theoreticians becomes essentially socialism, what is today socialism as opposed to what became communism. However, uh, one member, and uh, Bernstein and the other uh, uh, leaders of the, of the German social de- uh, democracy, and Rosa Luxemburg, and actually Benito Mussolini, and others are all members of the Second International, which is a Marxist international. One of the Russian members, uh, Lenin, uh, took the party, named, uh, party name of Lenin, uh, is outraged by this revisionism. He says, how do we have the Marxist totally planned society that, that, that guarantees individual, uh, that guarantees human dignity and freedom for the first time. How do we have that by means of these small concessions that the capitalists give us uh, to the labor unions uh, and government uh, regulation? We have to have an overall revolution in order to bring about the radically different planned society that Marx wrote about. And that is, that is the socialist aim. So Lenin opposed uh, revisionism, uh, insisting on um, a purer interpretation of uh, Marxism. And revisionism, you know, revisionism, re- revisionism means different things. This has nothing to do with revisionism in the historical sense, in the sense of revising history. This is revisionism in the context of the history of socialist thought. And revisionism became one of the worst, if not the worst, uh, curse word that uh, socialists and communists could uh, hurl uh, against each other. Um, during the uh, Sino-Soviet split of the 1960s, for instance, when the uh, Soviet leadership and, and Mao were at um, uh, loggerheads, 
uh, the uh, uh, Mao accused uh, Khrushchev and the other socialist, uh, the other Soviet leaders of being revisionists. Um, so, as we uh, uh, now uh, approach the 20th century, many people in the Western countries think that a socialist revolution is inevitable. Uh, certainly in Germany, the Socialist Party is getting more and more powerful uh, every year, gaining votes, deputies in the Reichstag, and socialist uh, parties are forming everywhere. I mentioned in Italy, uh, uh, among other places, and in Italy, the real radical firebrand and enemy of the revisionists is a young socialist named Mussolini. Um, in Russia, there's a small uh, socialist uh, movement, relatively small. After the 1905 revolution, it becomes legal, uh, except that, you know, these, these uh, uh, Marxist leaders insist on talking about uh, overthrowing the Tsar, killing the Tsar, and so on, then that's not legal. Uh, so some of them have to leave the country as Lenin does. In 1914, uh, in early 1914, Lenin gave a, uh, a talk in uh, Zurich, where he was uh, in exile in Switzerland, and um, he said something to the effect that uh, you younger uh, socialists uh, who are listening to me now, uh, you will be the ones who will have to carry on the torch of uh, of the socialist revolution. Um, I'm getting on in years. Well, he was only in his uh, uh, early 50s, late 40s, early 50s. Um, I'm getting on in years, and uh, nothing has happened so far. Um, the uh, Marxist uh, party in uh, Russia, as a matter of fact, had split into two sections, uh, his own, the Bolsheviks, and the other section, the Mensheviks. And we're just a few thousand people. Uh, he didn't have to make it explicit, but how in heaven's name were they going to overthrow the uh, imperial Tsarist uh, army, of, of two, standing army of two million men, uh, and reserves of many, many millions after that? How are these few thousand Bolsheviks uh, going to do that? Well, um, history came to Lenin's uh, aid. No, actually, what came to Lenin's aid was war and the uh, terrible European war that I'll talk about uh, tomorrow morning. The Bolsheviks were not able to uh, destroy the uh, largest army in the world, the Imperial Tsarist uh, Army. What destroyed that army was was the German army uh, and made it possible for the Bolsheviks to take over a, a shattered, uh, um, uh, collapsed uh, uh, Russia, and that is, uh, and that's what happens in at the uh, crucial year of 1917. I mentioned the man who uh, uh, who was shown decisively on the basis of uh, not only the latest documentation, but really documents that were known before. Uh, that the uh, so-called October Revolution, what the communists for decades called Great October, Red October, uh, this uh, 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 landmark in the history of the human race, was simply a coup d'etat by a few thousand Red Guards, uh, first of all in Petrograd and then in some other Russian towns, and that was followed then by the Civil War. This is Richard Pipes. A Russian historian. Actually, Pipes wrote a very good book on uh, the principle of property through history. Um, he's a Harvard professor. I think he still is, not emeritus. And I forget the name of his book, but you'd be, be able to, uh, to uh, see which one it is by looking over the title of his many books. It's a book on the, on the role of property in history. What's that? Freedom and poverty. Freedom and it's possible. It's possible. Uh, I, I read it in Czech, so um, uh, maybe I had a, a different uh, a different name in, in, in mind. Um, it's, a re- it's, a remark- it's a remarkable book. If for no other reason, we have a Harvard professor, aside from Bob Nozick, who the, for the first time mentions Ayn Rand. He talks about, he has some chapter, uh, kind of mixed up chapter about proponents, uh, modern proponents of property. I don't think he mentioned the Austrian school, although as I, I said, uh, uh, Martin Malia does was better informed about these uh, things. Uh, but, but Pipes has also a book on the, on the coup d'etat of October. Um, Richard Pipes is not to be confused with his uh, evil and twisted son, uh, Daniel Pipes, uh, who was... Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. 
Hey, come on, if you didn't boo for Rousseau, why are we going to you know, boo about for, for some for some uh, wimp uh, chicken hawk like uh, like Daniel Pipes? Well, uh, tomorrow that's going to be very relevant, okay? And I think that by now you'll know who to boo for. Anyway, so Pipes um, uh, shows it was a it was a uh, coup d'état. In any case. The Bolsheviks uh, do come to power. They win the Civil War. Um, they establish what they afterwards try to call war communism. Now, C- uh, Craig Roberts shows this um, uh, with uh, complete uh, convic- conviction as far as I'm concerned. It wasn't war communism. It wasn't a special um, uh, emergency uh, uh, system of measures uh, that, to deal with the Civil War and the war with Germany that was still going on. What it was, um, was communism, what, what uh, Lenin and all the other Bolsheviks understood as uh, communism. What they tried to do, what, uh, as much as they could, was simply abolish the market. They were Marxists, uh, authentic Marxists. They had come to power for this reason, to abolish commodity production, and that's what they did. The result was a catastrophe. Of course, there were other bad things going on, but that was enough to bring uh, uh, the Soviet regime to the to the edge of the abyss. Um, and Lenin understood that. He was always a very good uh, tactician. If we continue with this uh, war communism, abolishing all, pri- uh, all the private economic transactions, that's what's called speculation. If you, uh, uh, if you go to the edge of the t- town, bring in, bring in some of your books, uh, to exchange for a sack of potatoes that a farmer is bringing in, you were, ap- uh, you were, uh, uh, if found doing it, uh, uh, you could be shot on the spot by the uh, new Soviet secret police. Uh, Lenin realized that this whole system of communism, uh, as he said, was premature. So this is when, in 1921, he introduced the new economic policy of a modified Socialism and capitalism, the kind of thing that Gorbachev tried to realize finally in the last years of the Soviet regime, but was not uh, uh, able to. Uh, but now in the meantime, uh, I can talk a little bit maybe about uh, the Soviet Union in a little while and what happened there. But in the meantime, I want to give you uh, an idea of, um, of what the... Um, <laughs> of what the communist leaders were actually aiming at. Okay, this is a book by Leon Trotsky called Literature and Revolution. It's famous, I think, most of all, because of its last ridiculous sentences uh, about what will happen eventually in communist society. He says, the average human type will rise to the heights, the average human type will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Goethe, or a Marx. And above this ridge, new peaks will rise. As I remarked to a friend of mine one time, that would be a real hard class to teach. (laughs) Um, So those lines are quoted uh, um, by Mises, among uh, other people. But the whole... For the last few page, pages is very <laughs> instructive because Trotsky was, uh, uh, in a conventional intellectual sense, the most brilliant of the Bolsheviks. Uh, Robert Conquest also calls him the most ferocious for good reason, uh, but he certainly was um, uh, intellectually adept. Um, he understood the uh, uh, connection of ideas. And uh, this is what he understood as what was being aimed at, what the whole purpose of the Bolshevik Revolution was, the whole purpose of bringing communism uh, to Russia was. In the end, uh, what's going to happen uh, is that uh, man, man's, uh, man uh, will free himself from mystic and other, every, uh, every other intellectual vagueness, and will, his effort will be uh, directed to reconstructing society and himself in accord with his own plan. By the way, notice, and this goes uh, uh, throughout uh, Marx and Engels, whom I uh, discussed before, this odd notion that the human race is somehow one person, man, who has one plan to reconstruct 
himself. Uh, this evidently is, uh, uh, was seriously the way these people thought. Uh, for instance, the imperceptible ant-like piling up of quarters and streets, brick by brick, from generation to generation, will give way to titanic constructions of city villages with map and compass in hand. In hand. Well, you know, sort of urban renewal writ large. Uh, but that idea of the city villages, that uh, became a standard with uh, uh, modern uh, architects who essentially were uh, communists. Communist life will not be formed blindly like coral islands, but will be built consciously, will be tested by thought, will be directed and corrected. Even purely physiologic life will become subject to collective experiments. The human species, the coagulated homo sapiens, will once more enter into a state of radical transformation and in his own hands will become an object of the most complicated methods of artificial selection and psychophysical training. I mean, it's a good idea that the genome didn't fall into the hands of these people. Uh, it will become possible to reconstruct fundamentally the traditional family life. And as for reproduction, the human race will not have ceased to crawl on all fours before God, kings, and capital in order later to submit humbly before the dark laws of heredity and a blind sexual selection. You understand? Blind sexual selection, which is what's happened up until now. You know, the boy-girl thing. (laughs) That's blind sexual selection. It will all be planned. Man will make it his purpose to master his own feelings, to raise his instincts to the height of consciousness, make them transparent, extend the wires of his will into hidden recesses, and there, thereby to raise himself to a new plane to create a higher social biological type, or if you please, a superman. Well, uh, um, I'm not saying that that's the furthest thing from uh, from a reasonable comparison to what uh, Trotsky is talking about. Um, so this is that is the ultimate in the total planning, totally uh, uh, making the uh, uh, totally uh, conscious uh, the uh, development step by step everything that happens in society consciously planned beforehand, and that is um, I think that he discovered and uh, made it somewhat more explicit, the Marxist idea. Marxist idea is not simply uh, better housing and uh, better health care and um, uh, that kind of thing. It is total planning. It's metaphysical. And uh, uh, Malia understood that. Uh, Kalikowski understood that. Well, uh, as you know, uh, uh, most likely, Trotsky lost out in his uh, battle with uh, Stalin for leadership after the death of Lenin. Uh, Stalin was not uh, uh, as, uh, in any, in it, by any means, as um, agile and intellectual and a thinker as uh, Trotsky was. Um, and he had his problems. I mean, before, before you can go on to this, psycho, to this planning of the total psycho-biological uh, 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 nature of man and so on, you know, you have to produce enough John paper and so on. Right, you have to, uh, the sort of things that the Soviet regime never succeeded in, in, uh, in doing. So that, so Stalin was taken up by economic problems for a long time. And, um, now, one of the things that's, uh, uh, important to understand that's, uh, uh, didn't depend on modern uh, research and the opening of Soviet archives, but is confirmed by such research. Uh, and uh, uh, opening of archives, is that the Stalinist system was put into place um, in, its, uh, in its beginnings by Lenin. Uh, the first uh, labor camps, for instance, were set up uh, under Lenin. Uh, and um, the Soviet secret police um, that afterwards became the NKVD and finally the KGB, this was put into effect by Lenin under the, under the uh, name the Cheka, now, 
One thing I mentioned last time that's going to be of uh, great significance is the common turn, the Communist International, put in, uh, set up and uh, brought into existence by Lenin, uh, the organization of all communist parties in the world. There had been socialist parties and socialist movements and factions in many different places. After the communists take over in, uh, in uh, Russia, what Lenin does is uh, offer uh, uh, an invitation to all of these different socialist groups to join his new communist international. Change your name to Communist Party. Uh, for instance, uh, a CPF, the Communist Party of France, CPUSA, CPUK, CPC, Communist Party of China, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then you obey the regulations and rules of the common turn. And they have conventions from time to time. And the program of the common turn, they don't make any secret about it. It's not anything that, uh, that the um, FBI has to go and find out. They openly proclaim that uh, if it could even find it in the, in the newspapers, um, um, they openly proclaim that their aim is the overthrow by force, if necessary, by elections. Well, it's not too likely the uh, bourgeoisie is going to react to that. Uh, by force, uh, whenever necessary, of every bourgeois government in the world. Replacement of those governments by communist governments. See, Lenin uh, was enough of a Marxist to realize that, you, uh, that it, uh, according to his theory, you really uh, can't have communism in one relatively backward country alone. But what he said was that uh, Russia was relatively backward. However, the revolution in Russia would begin to spark the world revolution. So then you would have the revolution in, in Germany, in Britain, in America, in more advanced countries. And then you would have a world communist uh, community. So the common terms, uh, common terms, common terms aim was to uh, bring about these revolutions everywhere. Germany was the one he was most interested in. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, geopolitically, whoever controls Russia and Germany uh, is about to control the continent. And uh, yeah, you can have England off as a, uh, on the periphery there, but uh, you'd, you'd uh, get hold of Europe and then European colonies, and then the world revolution would really be underway. Um, this common turn uh, was a mortal threat to everybody who was not a communist in, uh, in Europe, including socialists, including the German SPD. The socialists of the of the German Social Democratic Party, uh, who broke with uh, with Lenin, um, and it uh, had some consequences uh, that were uh, uh, extremely unfortunate. Nowadays, uh, very often, the history of uh, fascism, let's say Italian fascism or German Nazism, National Socialism, sometimes <laughs> called a kind of fascism. These histories are written as if, as if they uh, uh, occurred in a vacuum. Uh, in Germany, uh, for instance, that there were uh, uh, elements that pointed in this authoritarian dire direction in previous German history, uh, the Italian uh, problem and the weakness of the Italian state are brought in. It is not made nearly clear, clear enough that Italian fascism, certainly, and German not national socialism to a large degree, were the product of uh, the communist threat. This is demonstrable in the, in the case of Italy, where the Italian Socialist Party became a Leninist party and openly threatened a Leninist revolution in Italy. And the Italian fascists, the supporters of Mussolini, didn't amount to anything until the public became very scared of this, of the takeover of the factories uh, by the uh, Leninist unions, uh, by the, uh, the takeover of uh, the uh, uh, land of the uh, po farmers by uh, squatters under the uh, direction of, uh, of uh, uh, sympathizers with uh, Lenin, uh, the announcement of the le by the leaders of, this, of the Italian Socialist Party that the Leninist revolution is around the corner, well, this empowered the Italian um, fascists. They began to get their support from the middle class and from businesses, and that's a whole other story that one could go into. But without any communist threat, Mussolini wouldn't have amounted to anything. And uh, to a large extent, that's also the case with uh, the National Socialists in Germany. Um, to, to many American historians, it's not very much of a big deal that if you were a German or an Italian or a Spaniard at the time of the Civil War, 
uh, or a pole, for instance, you had to live on the same continent with a power uh, that uh, told you that its aim was the forcible overthrow of your government in order to impose the kind of system on your country that we have in Russia. Um, in 19, as we know now, from uh, uh, this d- does come out from documents, and Pipes has written about this, in 1920 occurred a war between um, uh, the Soviet Union and Poland, the new Republic of Poland. And uh, Trotsky is, uh, was the leader of the, an organizer of the Red Army, <clears throat> led this attack into Poland, and uh, Lenin, Lenin expe- expected the Polish peasants and, and workers to, uh, to greet the Red Army with uh, open arms. Um, uh, bounties were offered for anybody who would hang uh, a priest or a, a landlord. Um, the uh, executions uh, took place on the way, and uh, uh, Lenin and his friends were looking po- forward to a Red Poland. What happened was that the Polish people under Marshal, uh, or then General uh, Pilsudski, uh, met the Red Army at the Vistula and stopped them. And um, uh, then some compromise uh, was reached between Russia and Poland uh, for a while. But the Poles, from, uh, from then on, as you can imagine, terrified of a possibility of uh, Soviet takeover by their big neighbor. So that uh, European uh, peoples in general, you'd have to be a millionaire or a vast landowner to fear a communist revolution. Uh, people knew what was happening in the Soviet Union. Mass famine, 1921, uh, under that so-called war communism. Mass terror, the red terror of the Cheka. Uh, the uh, uh, attempt to extinguish, uh, uh, annihilate Christianity. Open uh, uh, massive at- attempt by the, uh, by the government. People knew what uh, the, this communist regime entailed. Uh, and many of them uh, fled into the arms of demagogues, like uh, Mussolini and afterwards uh, Hitler. The um, the crimes of the Nazis were uh, one of the worst things that is, that uh, have ever happened in in history. Uh, but I think we know a lot about them. Um, I think in many cases we're uh, we're informed about them. Uh, in my case, I try to keep up with things, so I'm informed about them every single day of my life, literally every single day of my life. Uh, and what I read and on the Internet and so on, I hear about like things like the Holocaust. And I'm pretty sure I'm not going to forget. Um, however, the crimes of Soviet communism are much, um, more, uh, are much more rarely mentioned and figure much more infrequently, um, uh, much more uh, rarely in the minds of people. I mean, the average person doesn't know the first thing about them. I don't think that the average person has ever heard of Kolyma or Rakuta, um, massive uh, slave labor camps. Uh, the average person certainly has not heard about the uh, Ukrainian and, and North Caucasus um, uh, famine that uh, took, um, uh, we don't know exactly, six, seven, eight million lives, something like that. The uh, lying, uh, uh, deceptive, um, duplicitous rat who was a New York Times correspondent and won a Pulitzer Prize for his... Uh, uh, reporting from the Soviet Union that there was no famine going on, privately said pri- probably about 10 million people have died um, when he had to uh, report to, to the uh, to the Brit- to British intelligence. This man is Walter Walter Durante. He won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for the New York Times in 1932. There's now a movement to, uh, to Take his Pulitzer Prize away from him, on the um, uh, on the model of the Bancroft uh, Prize being taken away from uh, Belle Isle, this lying uh, uh, historian from Emory who said <laughs> said that nobody had guns, they hated guns. Oh, eek, yikes, yikes, guns uh, in colonial times. Uh, it's the last thing on the mind of anybody on the American frontier to have a gun. Uh, well, you can just call nine one one and the and the cops will show up if there's a problem with the Indians. Uh, so they, they took away uh, the Bancroft uh, Prize from him, unprecedented, and the idea is maybe uh, uh, somebody, somebody at the Columbia, uh, Columbia School of Journalism should uh, think uh, to take uh, Durant, posthumously to take Durante's prize away from him. Um, now, why should this be? There's been a, a very good book written by Anne uh, Applebaum. 
just came out a little while ago. Called the Gulag. The Gulag. The Gulag, as you probably know, is the uh, name, it's a Russian acronym given for the camp, uh, given to the camp system. System of forced labor camps. And Alexander Zolzhenitsyn wrote three volumes, who was temporarily an inmate, wrote three volumes uh, called the Gulag Archipelago. And the concept there is that these camps were spread like islands throughout the whole Soviet Union, like an archipelago of islands throughout the whole Soviet Union. Now, the victims of Soviet communism, um, actually, uh, it's not uh, correct to... uh, to concentrate on the gulag, more of them died outside of the gulag than died there in the camps. For instance, in the in the terror famine or in the constant executions. Now, uh, uh, and uh, I'll put down her name, right? Anne Applebaum, an uh, excellent, uh, really brilliant journalist, and, and more than a journalist, um, uh, very good historian. She's written before about this uh, issue. Um, she uh, uh, in one of her articles. Uh, she pointed out that President Clinton, some years back, uh, went to visit Minsk, which is the capital of what used to be called White Russia and now goes by the name of Belarus. And he had heard that there was a big killing field outside of Minsk, which in fact there was, of thousands of people, tens of thousands probably, uh, who had been executed by the Soviets under Stalin's time. And he asked uh, uh, the president of Belarus uh, to be brought there to say something about about it. And the president, I forget the man's name, said, no, we don't want to we don't want to wash our dirty linen in public. Uh, there's no need to go back to all that old stuff. Uh, it's water under the bridge. Um, let's just go on uh, from here. Now, contrast that which, what, with what's done in regard to the uh, crimes of the Nazis, where uh, memorials and, and, uh, and museums are set up all over the world which one might argue they they ought to be. But here, nobody wants to know about the places where um, where millions uh, suffered and died, which is one reason this woman, uh, uh, Applebaum, feels the the need to to bring this out, to uh, tell people about this. Um, And in general, this is the attitude of the Russian people. Their idea is, you know, it makes Russians look bad to keep talking about all these crimes of Stalin, because, in fact, in point of fact, yes, many of the Russians were uh, people were accomplices to this, of course, uh, and in uh, East European countries uh, as well. Um, so that you have a, a completely different attitude. That in regard to uh, Hitler's uh, uh, crimes, there's a, a, a constant uh, limelight uh, shining on it. In regard to uh, Soviet crimes, there's been an attitude of let's forget about it. Let's uh, uh, put it behind us. Nonetheless, people like Applebaum, or years ago, even before the Soviet archives were open, the great British historian Robert Conquest, did investigate these matters. And there is, for anybody who cares to look into it, uh, substantial literature on the subject. Now, um, one reason that, that uh, uh, we don't know very much about about this even now, and certainly a reason why we didn't know about it when, we, when it was happening, was because of a very peculiar bias on the part of the intellectuals. Uh, this is a larger subject, really, than uh, we can... Uh, uh, discuss in a few minutes, as are the specific crimes of Soviet communism. So I'm going to leave that for one of my last lectures tomorrow. And today we can, uh, in the time that remains, we can talk about uh, utopian socialism. We can talk about Rousseau, if you want to uh, bring up something about that. Uh, we can talk about Marx and the setting up of the Soviet regime. So, comments and questions. Yes. The Bakunin, what was his, uh, did he pass away around the same time that Marx did? Uh, uh, no, earlier than that, I think. Okay. I, I, I would guess the late, uh, 
uh, 1870s. Just a quick clarification. I, I missed them. Who's the guy up there that referenced the D.J. Gilas? Gilas. Milovan Gilas. I think he was a Montenegrin. I think he was a Montenegrin. Uh, that is uh, one of the Slavic people of former Yugoslavia. And he was a um, he was kind of a more or less second in command to Tito uh, during the uh, uh, World War II. Um, however, when the communist when Tito set up the communist regime in Yugoslavia, he became very disillusioned and um, wrote about and uh, wrote a book called The New Class and wrote about um, this new regime. And he said uh, because because he was a theoretician, he was a very intelligent man, uh, and he wanted to understand what is the nature of this regime. Uh, as a communist, he had opposed capitalism, which is a, a system whereby the, the means of production are under the, under the control, allegedly, of a few people. So the whole life of society is at their mercy. Well, what is this new regime? And he says, um, uh, and he was a friend of Stalin, or an acquaintance of Stalin. Uh, what is the nature of the Soviet regime? He said, what we're doing here in Yugoslavia is replicating the Soviet regime, the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union itself is a uh, uh, joint stock company owned by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And um, uh, and their employees, or serfs, if you want to look at it that way, uh, are the people of the Soviet Union. Um, it's the managerial, bureaucratic, uh, military class that rules the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, it's the end, of, it's a, not my idea, because it's, it equates too much uh, Western capitalists with... Um, with communist uh, rulers. But it's the idea you see at the end of Animal Farm. Everybody's read Animal Farm? Okay. Well, I think uh, some people should maybe not be uh, uh, going to see, you know, whatever, Halloween 13 or something, or Bride of Chucky, um, <laughs> uh, and spend their time maybe in more productive ways, like re reading 1984 or Animal Farm. And in Animal Farm... An animal farm, uh, at the end, right, those of you who have read it, right, the, the uh, animals are all around the uh, farmhouse, they look in, the pigs, who are the new class in this, uh, in this communist uh, uh, regime, uh, they're with the farmers, the human farmers, they're playing poker, one is trying to cheat the other, uh, they come to a fight, but the animals look in and they look from the pigs to the farmers to the pigs, and they can't tell who's who. Now, that's what Orwell believed, because he was still a socialist in the end. He believed that somehow the uh, capitalists uh, are uh, just a, a, an earlier version of what the communist rulers have become. Uh, now, what can you say about that? Um, the communist rulers have gained their position through terror and murder, uh, constant oppression, uh, and they uh, rule over people who... Uh, or they have ruled over people whom they've kept at a standard of living much lower than they than the than the people could have achieved in a free society. Uh, what, what have the capitalists have done on the other hand? Well, uh, the Walton family, uh, you know, you know, Walmart is the largest corporation in America, larger than any oil company, larger than any computer company. Uh, those those people have more money than all of us put together. And, um, and, and how did they make their money? By this retailing revolution. By bringing cheap prices to millions and tens of millions of Americans, um, in, uh, in areas that had never known retailing, uh, uh competition. Small towns in Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, all over, and then into larger cities. That's how they made their money. How does, how did Bill Gates make his money? Uh, Right by, by, of course, as the government says, by acting as a, uh, uh, a monopolist, uh, among other things, giving uh, uh, his various uh, products away free. But um, he made his money by serving consumers. This is uh, how good capitalists, not state-connected capitalists, but good capitalists make their money. It's not the same as the, as the leaders of, of uh, Soviet regimes. Uh, so, um, so, so when G. Loss, for instance, makes that kind of um, um, comparison, uh, I can't uh, follow him uh, in that. Uh, nonetheless, pointing out this, the, class, the class nature of the Soviet regime and communist regimes in general is very important. Um, I visited a few communist countries, uh, well, East Germany, uh, um, very early on, and a few times. Um, 
but then uh, towards the end of the regimes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union and Gorbachev's time. And um, one thing that was common to all of the countries was the existence of special stores, special uh, retail outlets. In um, East Germany, they were called Interladen, and there were similar stores in Poland, Hungary, uh, the Soviet Union, and so on. Those were stores where the new class, the nomenklatura, could shop. And they could buy uh, Japanese television sets instead of Russian television sets that often exploded. <laughs> they could buy uh, French wine instead of Bulgarian wine. And they, and, uh, they could buy, which they preferred really, Virginia uh, cigarettes rather than uh, Armenian cigarettes. Um, in any case, where well, you could buy goods that, are, that were competitive on the world market and not be forced to buy uh, East Bloc goods. Only a limited number of people, Cuba had the same thing, has the same thing for all I know. Only a limited number of, uh, of people could, could shop there. And um, I guess the others just thought there was an, in the nature of things. Um, but it, it uh, very much um, uh, carried out uh, Orwell's uh, idea and Bakunin's idea of what would happen in a Soviet society. Yeah. Do you have a, a time frame or a date to go along with uh, Trotsky's line sexual selection in his lifetime? Uh, uh, when the book came out, yeah, it would be the uh, early early twenties. <coughs> Hmm. Wait a minute. Yeah, July. Uh, he dates the introduction, July 20, <coughs> 29th, <coughs> pardon me, 1924. <coughs> yes? So I was just wondering, from a uh, existent Marxist position, even though it's extremely rare, <laughs> wouldn't Bernstein be considered a reactionary? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, for, uh, you mean for Marx's position, or let's say um, a Leninist position? From the position Marx held late in his life, considered a reactionary. Yes. Well, I'm not sure. He certainly was an enemy of of Marxism, of what Marx uh, stood for. <coughs> Whether reactionary would be the best term, I'm not sure. Why do you think that that would be the best term? Because it could be said, perhaps. Perhaps the Marxist could make the argument that he was helping to prolong capitalism. Well, well some, there might be Marxists who could have made that argument. I don't think Marx could have made that argument because Marx's view was that the forces that were, to, were going to destroy capitalism were acting in, inevitably, <laughs> implacably uh, every year. The system was getting um, uh, more and more vulnerable, so that uh, some propositions by a particular German theoretician wouldn't have made any difference. I don't think Marx would have said that. Whether uh, other uh, Marxists would have maintained that, I don't know. It's possible. Okay. Yes? Um, just a kind of amusing anecdote. A few, um, I guess it was a few years ago when the Enron thing happened. There was a new special, I don't know if it was 60 Minutes or one of the primetime news things, and they had, um, they were interviewing members of the Communist Party, what was left of it in New York City. And they sat down with one guy, and the reporter, of course, is lobbing these softball questions, and she says, well, now that you've seen all this, do you sometimes feel like saying, I told you so, to the, you know, the capitalists or so? In other words, so, to reviving the idea, well, see, we told you that sooner or later the capitalist system was going to destroy itself. Uh huh. Yeah. This guy just smiled as wide as could be. And right. says, well, we try not to gloat, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> this was a, a reporter from the New York Times. <laughs> no, it was one of the, one of the, the nightly news shows. I don't remember yeah. which network. It Very was. likely. The New York. Yeah. Um, New York Times. No, no, it was a lesser known reporter. But she was yeah. Um, this is typical of, of how these people are treated. New York Times had a, an article some years back about an old folks' home in California for, um, uh, for retired commies. And they had busts of Lenin there and Stalin and the works there. And it re really was kind of nostalgic, uh, 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 rather sweet in a way. Uh, you know, why not? I mean, these people are the grandparents of the reporters for the New York Times. Um, and... Um, 
th- there was no uh, animosity, no acrimony that these people had been communists, had been supporters of Lenin and, and of Stalin. No, they were just... Um, some year, years back, a man died in, uh, in the Moscow named uh, Kaganovich. Um, uh, what was his name? Lazar uh, Moisevich Kaganovich, of whom one of the Soviet dissident writers, Roy Medvedev, one of those Zamestat uh, writers I mentioned to you uh, this morning, of whom uh, Medvedev, very familiar, of course, with Soviet history, said that this Kaganovich had as much blood on his hand as Heinrich Himmler. He was in charge of the Ukraine during the uh, terror famine. He was in charge of the Moscow district during the purges. He died peacefully in his bed <coughs> in Moscow, an old man. Everybody knew where he lived, of course. Um, uh, never put on trial for war crimes, crimes against humanity, anything of that kind. And the New York Times had a very big obituary on him because he was a very famous man. He'd been in the Politburo um, uh very close to Stalin for many, many years, throughout most of, almost all of the regime. Um, he had built the Moscow subways as the leader of the Moscow district. Um, and it was a balanced obituary. I mean, there were some uh, good things that Kaganovich had done, the Moscow subways, for instance, and there were some uh, questionable things that he had done. Uh, for instance, he had been involved in, in repression. There's no doubt about that. But if you can imagine an obituary in the New York Times on Heinrich Himmler, okay, you know, the head of the SS, um, being balanced. Uh, Himmler, um, well, what do you want to say? Did away with urban sprawl in many Polish cities. Uh, you know, there's this positive and negative also. But this is, this is very, very typical of this mindset. Uh, the different the standards for judging uh, the communists and, and um, uh, people on the uh, so-called extreme right. Well, I think that's about all uh, for now. Okay, well, uh, we have two more sessions tomorrow, especially in the final session. You might think of, of uh, uh, questions that have come up along the line, and um, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll see what I can do about them. Thank you.